Um, there, a, there we go. That, I just wanted to see the recording light come on. All right, we're good. <laughs> And uh, we've, we've got more, see Scott Millar coming in right now, um, but we, we have um, you know, some newer members. So I think we'd benefit from a round of introductions. Um, so uh, why don't we, we go around and do that? Um, <clears throat> I'll start, Christopher Riley, uh, uh, co-coordinator of uh, the Woodland Partnership. And I divide my time between a, a part-time role um, URI supporting the uh, Rhode Island NRCS forestry program in my consulting uh, business, Sweet Birch Consulting. And I'll turn it over to Kate. Hello, everyone. Kate Sales, Northern Rhode Island Conservation District, as well as the RCD Council as the Forestry for Rhode Island Birds coordinator and the co coordinator of the Woodland Partnership. Right. I'll just go around the screen here and, and call on people. Um, up in the upper left, just like the upper left-hand corner of the state, you've got uh, Paul in Burrowville. Paul Rosali, president of the Burrowville Land Trust, a private land trust in the town of Burrowville. Happy New Year. Over to Ken. Ken Ayers, Chief of Agriculture and Forestry for DEM. Uh, David. I'm David Gregg. I'm the director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. Paul in situate. Paul Dolan, uh, Area Director for the Rhode Island Resource Conservation Development Council. Over to Fern. Fern Graves, I coordinate the Forest Stewardship Program for RIDEM. How about Amanda? Hi, I'm Amanda Freitas. I'm the Rhode Island Wildlife Action Plan Community. That's a, um, a grant program between the Rhode Island Natural History Survey and Rhode Island Division. Amanda, and how about Alana? Hi, everyone. Alana Russell. I'm the uh, Rhode Island FEMC State Coordinator and also the URI Biocontrol Lab Manager. Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Tremblay, I'm a forestry consultant and a newsletter editor for the Rhode Island RIFCO, which is the Rhode Island Forest Conservators Organization, Inc. Rupert. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Rupert Friday, Rhode Island Land Trust Council. And Meg. Good afternoon, Meg Kerr with the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. And Scott. I'm Scott Millar with Grow Smart Rhode Island. Right. And finally, uh, Cynthia, if you can speak, I think you're on the phone. Uh, Cynthia, would you like to introduce yourself if you're able to? She unmuted. I don't hear her though. Well, uh, Cynthia, if you're if you're able to um, introduce yourself, um, you're welcome to, or you know, chime into the meeting as you're able to. But uh, I see her mic isn't working, um, but we we know that she's she's here. Let me just if I I think people know Cynthia. She works for the Division of Agriculture. She, she uh, administers our Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program. Okay, that's very very helpful. Um, good. All right, well, <clears throat> we can um, jump into the agenda, you know, for our meeting. Uh, our, you know, first, you know, topic um, is, you know, defining the relationship between the, you know, the Woodland Partnership and ECRI, or the Environment Council of Rhode Island. Uh, this is a, a, something that we have uh, discussed uh, a bit as a partnership before, uh, but wanted to postpone making a decision or, uh, taking you know action on it to give folks some more time to uh, consider uh, in in you know, ideally you know review um, <clears throat> some of the materials on the ECRI website or um, Paul just sent sent around a, a list of ECRI's legislative priorities for this year and I know that some of you had a chance to respond to the survey that we put out do we have any um, results uh, at this point from that gate. 
Yeah, we have eight responses and we can go, um, we can take a look at it if that would be helpful. Uh, I'm happy to share my screen. Does that work? Maybe that's a good way to get into a discussion. Um, can everyone let me, can everyone see that? No. Okay. So it seems to me that um, with our eight responses, which is clear, it's not our whole group, um, there is an interest in join, um, maybe not joining or joining as, um, joining as maybe not necessarily the Woodland Partnership, but as a member, um, there's a lot of responses here. So feel free to take a look. Uh, most folks are not currently members of ECRI. We had one response of a member of an organization, um, their organization being a member of ECRI. I'm gonna guess that's Paul, is that you? And then with joining, we had some response that we should, 42.9% said that we should join as a group as the Rhode Island Woodland Partnership. Um, and then 51 or 57.1% said yes, but as some sort of hybrid or variation. We had no no's or no opinions. And then in terms of joining as a hybrid, these were the thoughts. So, you know, some of our members serving as a liaison to report on the Woodland Partnership. And that's sort of where we are. Again, only, we only had eight responses. Um, so there are more members of the Windland Partnership than just the eight that responded. I know I was one of them and Christopher was one of them. So I don't know if we wanna talk about legislative priorities, Paul, if you wanna run through some of those um, or if folks had thoughts and opinions uh, on the survey and the results. I just wanted to say that um, I did not fill out the survey because I don't have an opinion, but Audubon is an active member of ECRI. Um, for those of you who are members of ECRI or a bit more familiar, uh, per perhaps you could talk a bit about what the, the process is for formally joining ECRI and um, also interested in, in the, the possibilities for um, joining in, in some kind of hybrid uh, way as the, um, as that was a pretty popular option in the survey. Well, I, I'll say a few words about that. So ECRI has both individual members. So um, you can just, you can join as a person <laughs> who lives in Rhode Island and cares about these issues and pay your annual dues and then you're a individual member of ECRI or you can join as an organization and organizational dues are prorated based on the budget of the different organizations recognizing the variety and budgets for environmental organizations. Um, ECRI um, decisions are made based on votes taken at meetings and the people who are at the meeting get to vote. So there is no need for a quorum or um, a need for a certain percentage to be in favor of something. The people who are in the room um, become the quorum and make the decisions. About what, how much are the organizational dues? I'd have to look it up, Chris. I don't know off the top okay. of my head. It's, it's, not, a, not a ton. It's pretty nominal, I think ours for the Land Trust Council, um, it might be seventy-five dollars a year. Um, okay. It, it the mo at the most, it's one hundred and twenty-five. As I said, it's prorated based on your budget. So Audubon pays more because we have a much bigger bu budget. <coughs> it, it's very fair. I think an individual membership, at least, it used to be thirty-five dollars. Mm -hmm. right. you. I just wanted to clarify, Meg, when you say the people in the room, do you mean literally all of the people in the room or the members in the room? Um, people, to me, this is a, a challenge with ECRI. Um, it tends to be the people in the room. 
and the assumption is made that there are, that everybody's a member. I think sometimes people are um, won't participate in a vote because they recognize that they're not a member, but nobody checks to make sure that you're a member and that you should be allowed to vote. I think one of the, the questions that's you know come come up, maybe you know we've talked about a bit is you know we're a, we're a partnership with uh, some you know organizations um, you know including some of our nonprofit members that you know participate you know actively in, in advocacy efforts uh, and of course we have some core you know public sector partners um, who can't do that you know, at all or, or only in a limited fashion. And is that um, problematic for organizational or, you know, partnership membership in ECRI? I'm not sure I entirely understand your question. To me, the problem would be more on the part of the members of the partnership, um, not on ECRI itself. No, I think that's, I, I think that's what Christopher is saying. I, uh, and that's, somewhat applies to the survey because um, the survey's board a long time ago decided it wanted to be non-advocacy um, because it wanted to have the mo as much credibility on the science side as possible. And so um, the survey deliberately has not joined ECRI as an organizational member, although we have participated in things that ECRI does. In fact, we're co-sponsoring the video festival in a, in a month um, with ECRI. Um, but and it, it doesn't, I think if, if the Woodland Partnership were to join ECRI, it might limit some of the things that the survey could do with the partnership, um, but it's not, um, you know, if, if the decision were to join ECRI, it wouldn't be a bar to participation by the survey in the partnership because um, there's enough, you know, sort of uh, under the, un the understanding is, is pretty well, uh, uh, pretty broadly uh, understood that not that, that, the, that the Woodland Partnership doesn't speak for every single member on every single policy. Um, but there might be cases where our participation would have to be limited. <clears throat> Can you speak to what those limitations uh, might be, David? Well, I mean, I think this has actually come up before where the Woodland Partnership wanted to put in a, you know, a letter on some policy issue and the survey just, we can't sign a letter that's, uh, you know, advocating a, a particular policy or budget expense or something like that. Um, so, you know, like that kind of thing or, or a, a grant that was going to fund uh, like a, you know, a policy initiative, that kind of thing. So. David, if I can interject for a second, but but that didn't prevent you from from not continuing to be a member here. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Right. And and it didn't prevent you from either supporting or or opposing any other piece of legislation. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. We we have had discussions about a bunch of different things, and it has to be. A piece of legislation has to be, we had discussions at the board level, and a piece of legislation has to be, you know, pretty straight down the middle for our mission for us to do it. And even like, like invasive, like the invasive species bills. Um, I've testified on those, but the wording of my testimony is almost always, you know, this is the science about this invasive, you know, having a lot of this invasive in Rhode Island would be bad for these reasons, and it's presenting, you know, as one board member said, the science should speak for itself, which, you know, probably if science spoke for itself, we better, we wouldn't have been in the mess we've been in the last four years, but. Yeah, um, but that, and, and, and yes, you're absolutely, but that doesn't always happen. Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, more, more times than not, the science never speaks for itself. No, it doesn't speak for itself. And that's right. just, that's the problem, it right? Need, it needs somebody to get up there and do it. Yeah, and I, and I think that's that's what that's what being a, a member of ECRI might might provide us is a, not only a seat at the table but a voice for the science where there maybe isn't any or well, I think that, isn't any voice. Yeah, I think that the the argument that 
that basically, you know, kind of wins the day when we've talked about this is the idea we want, we want people to, um, to provide um, biodiversity data or, or data on the environment in Rhode Island to the Natural History Survey um, and not think that we're going to turn around and use it against them. Um, so, you know, a developer finds interesting things. We want them to, you know, feel at least, you know, somewhat disposed to provide us with that, with the, that information. Um, so that, that's kind of been the, the idea that, you know, or that if we had a really strong policy position and then we were providing, you know, data to uh, different parties on that policy thing that could be awkward, people would, would, you know, it would undermine the credibility of the data. So, I mean, I, you know, there are plenty of organizations that are saying the same things that we would probably want to say, but there should be some organization that's at least, you know, uh, uh, explicitly uh, trying to provide uh, science that's not got a spin. And I think that's kind of the, the sense that we've had. Well, if, if I might just add to the conversation, I know you guys know where my are, where RIFCO stands on this, and I, I'm all for a hybrid version because, you know, RIFCO has got a diverse membership and we've always avoided any kind of uh, political based discussions, even at our board meetings, it's, it'd be surprising how there just is no discussion about politics. Now that we do take, you know, policy stands um, or positions and, but those positions may not always coincide with the ECRI's position. So I'm a little concerned that how my board would react if I came back to them with the news that, you know, the Woodland Partnership has decided to join ECRI as a, as a <clears throat> member and be recognized at some level. I know the ECRI, when it puts out a position statement, like it's green report card or whatever it's called, they don't list every organization necessarily that that is a member, but it's pretty easy to find out who is. And I, I don't know, I don't think my board wants to go there. And so I'm all for having a, some sort of hybrid option that, you know, has some sort of layers on and, and it sounds like there already is. I don't know if it's you, Christopher, or you, Kate, or whoever's been meeting with them. And, 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 if, that, and if we have a line of communication, there's cross membership on both of our boards. That's great. I just don't know what the advantage is for the Woodland Partnership to actually join ECRI as one of those members and, and the extension of that is that we support whatever the ECRI decides to put on their green report card or, or whatever position they, policy position they take. I think we should, I think we're perfectly capable of standing our own, on our own two feet or 120 feet, whichever. <laughs> how, many, how many members of the Woodland Partnership now, Christopher? There are, uh, you know, 65 or so people on the email list. Yeah, okay. Whether they're actually members or not I, is debatable, but I think they're all part of our network. Yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're getting, you know, we're going to get, get around, you know, 15 people or, you know, sometimes more than that. For right. Me, you know? right. So those of you who are most familiar with ECRI have been talking about the individual memberships in the the organizational memberships. Of course, we you know we, we have you know some um, organizational members here, perhaps some individual members as well. I'm I'm not sure. Um, is is the, the the hybrid that we're we've been talking about is that essentially um, the individual or or memberships or you know those who 
um, belong to member organizations um, like uh, Audubon or uh, the Land Trust Council? Is that what that would mean? Possibly. Might be helpful for Christopher or Kate, one of you to speak to what your goal, what the goal of joining ECRI would be for the partnership. That would right. help me. Well, as, as I understand it, and you know, for the, those of you who are you know most involved with you know policy efforts, can, can chime here too. Uh, but it would be to facilitate, um, you know, you know, being part of a of a broader you know coalition, um, and to bring more you know energy and resources into some of the the forest you know conservation. Uh, issues and concerns that we that we care about uh, and to strengthen our uh, F, you know our efforts in, in those areas um, you, you know inclu including um, forests um, in the states you know climate change mitigation and adaptation efforts um, or um, you know you know, recognizing and, and trying to um, you know minimize the, the loss of forest land for example yeah, I'm, I would also just want to chime in that, uh, Christopher, when we presented on the values report, um, I got the sense that it might be a good idea to have more, just a slightly more uh, forest people than are currently there to balance the renewable energy folks as well. As I yeah, said, it yeah, tends yeah. to be the people who are in the room and you know, my, my thought for the Woodland Partnership would be to encourage those of you who are on this call and who are members of the Woodland Partnership who want to, to join ECRI. <laughs> so there's no reason, I don't think, why the Conservation District, for example, Kate, couldn't join ECRI, maybe you already are, um, and then show up because ECRI becomes the voice, as I've said, of the people who show up. Um, I think it's challenging for, our, I'm thinking about the various coalitions that I participate in and lead and the coalitions don't join ECRI as a coalition. The members are a member of the ECRI if they care to be. Um, and I agree, it would, be, it would be wonderful to have more uh, voices there who are thinking about forest values and the important, you know, making that an important part of the climate conversation. Um, Rupert and I, are there and we're carrying that water for you. And there, um, so that that would be my thought for the group to think about. I'll second that. I, I as a public agency, I don't know that we join anything. I typically don't, and I don't, don't even know technically if I'm a member of the Woodland Partnership. But we participate an awful lot because we want to be part of the conversations. That's why I'm here right now. So I, I think we we have to do, maintain a degree of separation, but. I think that, that what you're advocating of as individual memberships, I would think is, is perhaps the best way to go about this. Thanks. When are the, uh, the ECRI board meetings? Mondays, help me here, Rupert. They're Monday evenings or Paul, is it the first, second, third Monday? <laughs> There's Polcom and there's the regular ECRI board meeting and they're usually on different Mondays. So many meetings. Okay. Those, those would be the time for Woodland Partnership members to, to show up. Yeah, they're usually at 5.30 on a Monday evening. I think political committee has been meeting at 4.30. If, if folks wanna be part of the selection of priority bills that ECRI does, that's done at the political committee. You have to go to those meetings. Um, so it's the first Monday of the month, 5.30 to 7. Is that, it the that, ECRI meeting? That, that's the general uh, ECRI membership and board meeting. And I think the political committee might be the second Monday. Sounds good. <laughs> we can find out. Give you the facts, not just surmising. There are there others amongst us here who, you know, who, you know, would be up for, you know, adding to the, the Woodland, you know, partnerships strength at, at every board meetings? 
Um, if, 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 I, if I can answer a little bit of that from, from our perspective, from the land trust, uh, private land trust, uh, we, we go there with, with our intention and, with, and, and as David mentioned, mentioned with, with our mission in mind. Um, and, and when we do that, we're, we're specific, we're try, we try <laughs> to be as, as specific as possible. So if it's uh, something to do with a gas power plant in the middle of the woods here, yep, we're in. If it has to do with the PC or the, EF, or the Energy Facility Siting Board, yep, we're in. Land use, um, uh, wetlands issues, uh, yep, we're in. Uh, forest issues, strictly forest issues, we listen, but it's, it's, um, it's sort of kind of on our priority, but not, not top of the list. Uh, it might be better, Christopher, I don't know if you're a member, but you should join. And, and then that way, that, that's the hybrid, and, and you, you represent uh, at least the Woodland Partnership, and you and you can go in there as an individual. Actually, you can go in there as a, a business too, as a consulting firm. So, pick one. And uh, but I but I think that's where the that's where the, uh, the the focus should be. I I I I can't do it. And I don't I don't know if anybody else here can with their particular missions all of a sudden. Um, jumping on to something else and saying, well, you know, we should talk about, I don't know. The, the only time it happened, and, and, you, and you know the story really well, was when they were, when they were uh, constructing the, uh, uh, the uh, um, I forget, forget the name of the report, and they forgot to include forest in their, in their findings. Uh, it not, has, yes. Not, not, not one mention of of those darn trees and and uh and i was there and texted you and and uh pretty soon all of a sudden there was a page of stuff in the final report about forest so yeah but not normally well I, you know i've yet for joining as an, as an individual member um and i'm currently on a on a board that happens to, to meet every other month on first Monday evening, um, but, you know, would, would be up for participating as I can. Um, maybe, maybe some others too. It'd be great to have you, Chris, Christopher, it'd be great to have you representing um, the partnership's interests, um, if you can. I'm, I'm just curious, how, how many are, of us are members? Of Ekron. So just two of us? We have the Land Trust Council too with, oh, with, uh, member with too. this yeah. camera is off. Yeah. Yeah. Three. Mm. And then in past conversations I've had with Rose Mark, they are not interested in joining Ekron. I don't know what this staff can speak, but interesting. Well, I think what I'm, what I'm hearing is, you know, that we, you know, we bring more, you know, more strength with, um, you know, in, individual um, or, or memberships or memberships of organizations that are part of the um, members of the partnership um, that are able to, to and, and would like to do so as an organization. Yeah, and just, I, I already said it, but I'll just say it once more. Um, joining ECRI accomplishes nothing showing up at the meetings is where you can have some influence. And I understand, Christopher, that you've got a conflict for some of them. We all do. <laughs> well, well, let's see what we can do. Is this, is this something, um, I mean, I, I sort of hearing a, some consensus here, is this something that um, would, would be helpful to, to, to vote on or? Yes. or? yes, we've been doing this for a year. Let's get over okay. it. Let's make a decision one way or the other. Right. It seems like the, I don't know, it seems like it'd have to be unanimous for us to join, no, unless we're willing to lose. And I, I think the point is, Amanda, like Amanda, I think the point is, is that we, I think we've reached the conclusion that any, any one of us 
is welcome to join if you're not already as an individual member. And if there's any, inf and act as a liaison, it would be nice. And if there's any information to carry forth between the two groups, uh, Christopher, if you can't make it to every meeting and there's an, an alternate person that can just to sort of listen in on what's going on. I was just gonna you, say, you I might can't. You might could distribute the calendar and say, hey, I'm, you know, can anybody pick up this meeting and at least listen in on what's what's happening? Because apparently there's no there's no um, limit on people that can just listen in on the Zoom session for the meeting. I take it. There's no limit to the number of people who can come to an equity meeting, right? Or a political committee meeting, right? But if we're, I mean, if we're, and there are people in the room that are thinking about forests, because I am, I'm Audubon, and Rupert is the land trust council is, yeah. so it's not like it's missing entirely. But we work on a lot of issues, right? It's not our single focus. So I would make the motion that 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 we resolve this by encouraging Mr. Riley to join. If we have any money, maybe we could uh, reimburse. Does the partnership have any money? <laughs> could we reimburse you for your your uh, your expense, um, or in, you know somehow? And then um, and and Christopher just. Um, act as our liaison in a manner of speaking. And uh, if there are any alternates that are available when you can't participate, if the if it's important enough, if there's a, something on the agenda that we should be hearing, maybe you could distribute the agendas to us ahead of time. Um, and we just participate in that way. I'll say that. Sure, I'd, I'd be up for joining and participating as I can and you know, trying to you know, coordinate with some likely alternates so we can try to have, you know, have some more participation there. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll just try to, you know, do, do that into the, the Woodland Partnership or, or my, you know, my sweet birch role and, and keep it clear of the URI one. I'll second that too. Right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. All right. Opposed? Same. All right. Looks like that passes. Um, I'll uh, I'll go to the website. Look for look for my uh, look for an application. Um, but good to good to have that discussion. And um, since we've been talking about it for a long time, and make a decision on it. All right, uh, so the second uh, agenda item um, is, you know, our policy and legislative discussion. Um, you've got another number of things there. Um, Ken, I don't know, would it, would it be helpful to sort of to, um, give you the, the mic for a bit just to bring sure. us up, up to date and sort of set the lay of the land from the state agency perspective? Yeah, sure. And TJ is very actively involved in this. He said a funeral service today, so uh, he's doing why he's not participating. But um, we were deep into follow up to everything we've been talking about. Um, you know, the particular that relationship between renewable energy and and forest preservation. Uh, director was having conversations with the governor's office, uh, having conversations with the Office of Energy Resources. Um, and circumstances have obviously changed a little bit in the past couple of weeks. Uh, we're now in the middle of a transition. And uh, so some of that's paused, not that it's any less important, but we at, at yet uh, don't know how things are gonna shake out, to be honest. Um, so uh, It's important we're keeping the ball rolling as much as we can, continuing our focus on the, the legislative piece, which I know TJ has been working with Scott Marlar closely on to make sure that DM's feelings and perspectives are in that piece of legislation, which uh, you know, I, I sense it more likely to be submitted on the outside, not DM, but that we're, we're you know, we've, we've imparted our sense to it um, in terms of moving forward on kind of the, the uh, 
upper level discussions that need to, to happen on making sure that renewable energy or hoping that renewable energy development and forest preservation can work side by side without either compromise or the other. Um, a bit of a pause until things, you know, work themselves out, to be honest. Uh, there, there, there's going to be leadership changes in the state, obviously, you're getting the, the governor and Lieutenant Canaver to be governor has the right to choose his leaders, his cabinet, um, et cetera. So that's all happening as we speak. I, I trust that, have the sense, and I can't speak for anybody here, that uh, the changes will be minimalistic. Uh, there's only you know a limited amount of time left in the term. I hope uh, you know the current director stays. That would be uh, great. Um, but um, we just have to wait for some of that to, sh to shake out before we resume efforts. But it was very active and uh, everything that we talked about was uh, being taken up and done. Um, so that's kind of you know where we are. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that um, it's stopped for every any chance that we can to move uh, those goals forward, uh, which don't just exist at, at the policy level, programmatic level exist. Um, we're, we're doing that. And that the goal of, of, of uh, amplifying the role of forestry, protecting it, um, fleshing it out is still a priority for me in this role and we're doing everything that we can to, to accomplish that. Um, it's a uh, important role and operationally very complex when you think about uh, in particular what the Division of Forest Environment is involved with on a daily basis. Um, but we're moving forward, uh, taking a look at all our management areas, um, particularly the ones that are under DFE control, um, bringing them back to uh, life, trying to strip the staff to the degree I can of the unnecessary or less important work that they've, that's been, in some cases they've had to do because uh, you know, that it's, there's no one else to do it. Um, it. It's amazing the challenges to be frank, the amount of dumping that occurs on state property, the amount of uh, other issues that the staff has to deal with, which, which challenge uh, in, infrastructure issues in, in particular. Uh, uh, is, is incredible. It, it really compromises our, our mission. Those are all things that I have to deal with, um, but we are full steam ahead in every way that we can be, but realistically, we have to recognize that uh, you know, there's a political transition happening and that's gonna change uh, in, uh, pace, I guess is the best way to say it, at which all this happens. And a question, I, I know you can't speak to the specifics and um, I think we're all very much aware that we're in a political transition, but in your conversations with the Office of Energy Resources, was there any discussion of any legislative change that they might be considering or administrative change to the current solar siting statutes or programs? Fortunately, the director has taken this on as a priority and was involved in those discussions. I wasn't in the room when it was happening. I wasn't told of that, um, not aware of that, but I, I don't really have firsthand information there. I think the good thing is that it's, she considers it a really high priority and, and was you know, having discussions at, at the highest level. I'll, I'll try and find out some more information about that though. Thank you, Ken. I, I have a couple, a question. Um, we had the, um, draft legislation that Scott's working on with DEM, and I think you just said that it'll likely get introduced outside of DEM or be a DEM bill. Did I hear you correctly? And I have the sense of that, and, and in, in part because just of kind of where where we are with all that that's going on, the uh, it's it's more likely. And I'm not saying that we're, we're this is uh, a final as well. Um, that it be it would that would come from outside of DEM. That's my sense of it. If, if I can just add to that, TJ and I had a conversation last week, and um, it, and my concern was with the transition to a new governor um, that this bill, the Forest Conservation Act, may get lost in that transition. So I asked TJ to try to connect 
uh, with with the director to see if she would be in agreement to allow the bill to go forward outside of the DEM legislative package. Therefore, the bill could, could be submitted um, by the Woodland Partnership, um, Gross Smart, in partnership with DEM, just letting whoever the sponsor is going to be know that all these entities are on board with this proposed bill. That might be the most efficient way of getting it introduced this session. Again, assuming that's okay with the director. So I, I just wanted to let you all know that um, the Nature Conservancy and Audubon were asked to brief a number of legislators on the whole issue of solar and solar siting and forest protection. And we're doing that on February 2nd. Um, and I will, this is helpful. I'll, um, I think I'll write my sentence about what I'm gonna say about this bill and maybe let you, Ken and Scott look at it, make sure I'm saying it correctly to reflect this conversation. But I would, if it's okay with you, let them know that there are conversations about a forest conservation bill. Does that yeah. make sense? I mean, I would agree with Scott's assessment with all that's going on uh, with the transition that the better chance of it getting the light that it needs to get, to be frank, is probably having a legislator, you know, focus on it, shepherd it through, et cetera. And there are a number of legislators that have been involved with the prior solar siting conversations and they may or may not be who you all want to have be the sponsors, but they're interested in this issue. While we're on the subject of the bill, if anyone has any further comments, I know TJ circulated a bill that um, had some proposed changes from DEM internal review. That was just before the holidays. If anyone has any further comments, please get them in ASAP, because I know TJ would like to get a, a, a final draft before the director as quickly as possible. Is, it, is this the same legislation of our draft? Um, I, I've only seen one. Is there been a second? There was a bill sent around just before Christmas that right. TJ, right. Uh, that actually Christopher forwarded to the whole Woodland Partnership yeah. um, list uh, that contained DEM's um, edits. But not, nothing since. Could somebody recirculate that one? I'm, I'm missed that. The last one I saw was the one you circulated, Scott. I circulated the same version just before the holidays. So they're, they're one and the same. So if you see comments from TJ or others, that's the bill. But to make sure everybody's on the same page, Christopher, you would, if you wouldn't mind just resending that email to the whole sure. partnership list. So All right, so we'll, we'll get that out there following the meeting. Any other comments uh, on the Forest Conservation Act? Things to clarify about that? Um, Scott, you had mentioned other entities introducing it. You mentioned the partnership. I thought we, you know, for the same reason the last, sorry, Paul, for the same reason the last conversation. Um, ended in us deciding not to join ECRI, I thought we wouldn't introduce anything like that because all of our members have different restrictions. Seems like that'd be a gross smart thing. We gross smart would be happy to put it in. Um, and we can say it has support from Audubon, hopefully the Nature Conservancy, whoever else would like to, or feels like comfortable endorsing it, that, that would be fine, but we'd like to make sure at a minimum uh, to say that DEM has reviewed and approved this bill. But I think it would be good to say that this came out of uh, the forest values report uh, that was produced by the, um, by the Woodland Partnership. Was it though? Were we, it was the tree council. Well, to, yeah, I guess it was, I guess it was Woodland Partnership members who worked on it, but yeah, you're right. It was the Tree Council and DEM that officially published that report. But it was but, a joint effort. I, I it was a joint that. effort. It, 
yeah. let's put it this way. Does anybody have any objection if um, it's portrayed to whoever is going to be sponsoring this bill that the Woodland Partnership reviewed this and supports the or, or doesn't have any objections, supports the concept, you know, words that you feel comfortable with? Because I, I think it would be important um, for people to know that. I think that if there's any organizations that have specific opinions about it, like, is, like if RIFCO wanted, I, I think any letter of support for it, um, even if you're already a member of the Woodland Partnership might not hurt, I suppose. Right, a comment letter or a letter of support. I think that's probably when it gets heard. If it gets heard, that would be important. Seem to, I'm having sort of deja vu, uh, Scott, from an earlier, uh, some earlier piece of legislation or something that we did. And I, um, I think at the time we said that, um, you know, if the if it, if there was language like, you know, this was developed with the assistance of the Woodland Partnership, that's fine. And if there's a list of people in the Woodland Partnership who support this legislation, just the survey can't be on the list. That's that's the only thing. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about the forest values report not really coming out of the Woodland Partnership, there are a lot of ideas that come out of the Woodland Partnership, but almost all of the products are attached to like the people here that take it and run with it and sort of through their own organization or through other partners. Um, so I think if we start doing different things, then we lose a lot of members and a lot of flexibility. Yeah, I think the, the formulation of was developed with the assistance of the Woodland Partnership is, is that one seems to me to be fine. Um, how, how much further you go, uh, I'm not 100% sure, just that we can't appear, you know, National History Survey probably shouldn't appear in a list supporting a bill. But this is legislation, so nobody's going to look at whatever this document is you're talking about until it gets to a hearing. Right. So it's, you know, don't sign the letter at the hearing and don't show up at the hearing and yeah. Right. Or, or have the, right. Or have the conversation. I mean, I, you know, we may end up wanting to do it, but I'd have to talk to the board first about what they wanted to do. That's all. Right. Right. Most of us, it, our organizations were on the forest conservation advisory committee, but that was a separate thing that advised the uh, report. So maybe it's that. And this is primarily, and again, this wouldn't be testimony. I'm just trying, if we're explaining this to a proposed sponsor, if that person is probably reasonably going to ask who's been involved in this, um, I'm just trying to find the correct way of indicating that the Woodland Partnership had an involvement. I think it would be reasonable to tell a proposed sponsor that there were a lot of people with forest conservation expertise that looked at this bill at a minimum didn't have any objections. It, it's, it's not an endorsement necessarily because, and then I can tell them that each individual member of the partnership would, would offer testimony in a way that they feel to be appropriate. Does that sound okay? I think you can say that it was presented to the Woodland Partnership and that there were some comments provided. These are the folks that have expertise in this issue. And that, yeah, and some and some of them are advocates and do advocacy work and will show up and do testimony at the hearing. All right. Well. Thanks, Scott, for, for moving ahead with that. And it sounds, sounds as if, you know, there will be you know, demand for, for letters of support from the organizations or individuals who can provide them if we get to the hearing. One last thing, Scott, as you're looking for sponsors, if you want to chat, um, I can let you know the folks that we're briefing and what kind of response we get. And it's certainly up to you who you want to approach, but I'm happy to have that conversation. No, that, that would be very helpful and I and much appreciate it. So I'll be in touch. Christopher, can I bring up one more thing? 
Yes, please go ahead, Ken. Uh, one of the things that Kathy Sparks started uh, before she left was an evaluation of the divisions of uh, fish and wildlife in the forest environment. Um, in when it comes down to that part relating to forest environment, it's their state lands management component, not all of forest environment, but that aspect of it. We're working with an outside consultant uh, who would like to have a couple of town hall meetings with uh, folks from like, the world of forestry um, and have people respond to a survey. So uh, you'll, you'll see sometime near future and probably within the week actually a survey sent out to the Woodland Partnership and others, RIFCO, Tree Council, et cetera. And then a couple of town hall meetings, quote unquote, arranged with this consultant. Again, the focus is on state lands management, forestry uh, related, but just to give you a heads up. Thanks, I'm sure there'll be a lot of, a lot of interest in that, in this group. Um, so that's great if you can send it to the list and hope we'll have robust participation at the, the town halls. Thank you. And I should maybe already know the answer to this, but it, are stakeholders who are sort of dual stakeholders going to get two different surveys or do you know if it's all one? We've been talking about that and um, they may well get two different surveys, Amanda. It's, it's uh, but I'll, I'll bring that back to the group. I don't, I don't I don't know that I have a preference. I would just want this crew to know that it would be great if they could weigh in on wildlife as well if, if it Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The, the fish and wildlife survey to. will be much 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 different than the forestry survey. You're exactly right. I might have to go back through that Excel spreadsheet of stakeholders and see yeah. where you all are listed because <laughs> we want your input. Great. Well, following the uh, discussion of the Forest Conservation Act, uh, I just also wanted to bring up the policy brief that we have been working on and circulating, um, just you know, called Key Strategies for Conserving Rhode Island Forests. And um, can I, I understand, or, or at DEM, uh, or you were hoping to get, um, you know, the sort of department's um, approval or, or you know blessing to move forward with that but uh, do I understand from TJ that with the, the transition um, that there, there hasn't been a lot of activity um, you know to report on that since since last time yeah I mean I, I would say that we're good on almost everything that was written the only part that we were just not uh, completely finalized was the legislative part that we were, were talking about. Almost everything else was fine, uh, you know, almost a no brainer. Uh, but, you know, if we, uh, I'll circle back on that as well. Um, I think the only reason we didn't green light that was because we just, on this one part, which we're discussing right now, we hadn't settled on on the approach, That that's all. Um, but good point, um, we'll, we'll, I'll make sure we get back to you on that as well. Okay, thanks. I know, know that we, we've got some, some, some member else will Looking forward to, to being able to distribute it and, and use it when, when we can do so. So that'll be okay. Great. Yep. Thank you for the reminder. Any other policy or legislative uh, topics or issues that um, people would like to discuss? All right. Um, well, not hearing any, I think we can. We'll launch into updates just before doing so, since I think we'll be having um, some people dropping off at two. So we bring up the date of the next partnership meeting, um, which, you know, the, the third Thursday of February is it's the it's the 18th. It happens to fall during the school vacation week. Um, so Kate and I uh, thought it was worth uh, bringing up if we wanted to stick with the meeting on that date or consider moving it um, uh, to another date or week. Uh, I believe we're, we're hoping to have uh, Sean O'Rourke of the uh, Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank um, come and you know, sp speak with us about uh, opportunities for you know, aggregating uh, projects for watershed protection and you know, talk about how we could uh, make our case for doing more with that. Is there an issue with his availability? Have you checked with him? 
I believe he's he's available uh, on on the 18th. Um, the the following week, uh, another st staff member from the infrastructure bank uh, is is unavailable. Um, but though you know the week before, you know, say say February 11th, you know, could could be an option. Um, the you know the week of that that week isn't isn't ideal for me um, personally, but I'm, I could make it happen, uh, participate. Um, and um, but I'm just one one member. And what what I'm sorry is the 18th not ideal for you, Christopher, or the 11th? The 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 18th. But I, so can, is, I can do it. So is the 25th an option? Uh, well, there's a, a, a second member of the infrastructure bank team, Sydney is a team, is a team, if I have her name uh, correct, who, who would probably join uh, Sean and, and she'll be she'll be away that week. So that's that's not a good date. Um, so I think we, you know, we'd be looking at the <clears throat> the 11th, probably say if we changed it. Um, that, that would be the, uh, the one obvious alternate date. I'm good with either the 11th or the 18th. If you can get Sean and his coworker for the 11th, uh, but that's just me. Anybody all else have an opinion one way or another? It's all the same to me. Right. You can make the 11th, not the 25th. Okay, why don't we follow up with Sean and um, try to try to solidify something? Um, you know, I, I I wouldn't mind the eighteenth or I mean the eleventh if folks can can do it, um, but you know can make the eighteenth happen. Um, just uh, might be doing it from elsewhere or have some distractions. Um, yeah, we'll, no problem. We'll follow up with you on that. Um, good. All right, well, let's um, we'll go into our partner updates now. Um, we'll just go around the screen. I'm, Ken, you're up there in the, in, you know, the corner of my screen now. I think you, you may have shared most of your updates, but I um, just wanted to give you a chance to, um, if there's anything more you'd like to talk about from um, for BEM in the, in the update round. Thanks, uh, no, nothing really, I, I've, I've covered the ground and, uh, only to update that I have to drop off. I'm sorry about that. But, but, so thanks for joining me. Being here. Enjoyed these meetings, but I'll, I'll talk to you over there. Take care. All right, we'll go over to David. I have time. nothing substantial to update you all on. Hey, how about um, Mark? Uh, um, from Rifco. Uh, we're, I guess we're co-sponsoring. There's a, there's a, I don't know if Christopher, you were going to talk about this, but the February 2nd virtual town hall for the Oak Resiliency Project. Was that something you were going to talk about? And I'll, go, go I'll, ahead, go ahead, Mark. I think it's, um, it's just a virtual town hall um, from uh, at, at noon on February 2nd. And we've gotten, uh, I think you've sent around the save the date posters already, haven't you, Christopher? And uh, I'm running it in the new, we got the, the newsletter up on the screen, finishing that up, the quarterly newsletter. So that'll go out with that and in our monthly e-news, but otherwise it's pretty quiet on the home front here. Oh, uh, uh, wetlands regulations. Um, I mean, we're providing some comment on that, but um, I, you know, it's too bad Ken just bowed out of the meeting because if you look at the wetlands regulations, it's always been like this, but there used to be two divisions, right? Ag and forestry. Now it's ag and forestry together. And so Ken, in a way, is in charge of three different sets of rules. One for farmers with a capital F, one for farmers with a little lowercase f, in other words, not real farmers, but hobby farmers, and one for forest landowners. There's three different sets of rules on how they can function out there with or without, uh, you know, uh, uh, permits. I mean, you know, there's exemptions for activities. 
and Ken, and I was hoping, I, I, I should have grabbed him before he left, but what do you think about having to like oversee three different sets of rules for people who are farming and or you know, working in the woods? But Fern, Fern's on the line and uh, maybe Fern can speak to that when it's her turn for an update. How's that? Oh. Why don't we uh, why don't we go over to, to Fern then to see if she has anything to say or, or other updates? Um, I don't have any other updates. All I have to say about the wetlands regulations is it doesn't look like they're going to be affecting forestry much, but we are going to revisit the best management practices. Um, this will hopefully result in few changes and changes, if any, will be productive. Um, rather than not productive. And hopefully this will result in a new BMP manual and some workshops to help educate loggers, foresters, and landowners. We never do any BMP workshops anyway, which we probably should periodically. So this will be a good opportunity for that. Uh, we don't know exactly when this will happen, but it will be coming down the line. So there is one thing, Fern, that's a little bit more restrictive and, and uh, you know, the, the the buffers to vernal pools and um you know was it was less than what uh, isolated wetlands less than three acres in size didn't used to be regulated at all and 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 now they are um so there is an expansion of the jurisdiction um and which which is a good thing um and it's just that now there there may be more acreage uh that is subject to scrutiny either by yourself under forestry or or the ag folks and then and then more room for complaints to be uh handled by the enforcement folks you know so there, there could be some uh expansion of of uh applicability and jurisdiction when it comes to limitations on what people can or can't do either out in the woods or on the farm that is true, but practically, you're correct. Yes, practically, I don't think it's going to have much effect on most activities because I tell loggers and foresters to be careful in wetlands anyway, no matter. What. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and that's the case. Um, and, so and hopefully, and yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. There's well, a lag over here. Finish your thought, please. So hopefully, there won't be any changes to how anyone really does anything, but yes, there might be changes in room for complaints, but I think that may only affect people who are being naughty anyway. <laughs> right, right. And we foresters that are out there putting paint on trees and writing the management plans have to incorporate a broader set of rules now and make sure that we're not staring our clients in the wrong direction. It's the woodcutters who act on their own that we, you know, that, that are really the, the ones who are going to have a learning curve on this, and the ones who your our our, our workshops because Rifco has always sponsored the past the BMP workshops in the past, and we would love to continue doing so in the future. Is there a, a date around which the uh, changes to the wetlands rules are expected to be? Finalized. The comments, the final comments are due tomorrow. Okay. So I don't know what if there's a date for the final promulgation. Does that, does that need to go through the legislature? No. Okay. It's a strictly a DEM agency thing. Okay. Well, we'll 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 follow follow along on it. But thanks. That's helpful. Oh, let's see. Next up, let's go to um, to uh, Paul Roselli. Thank you, Christopher. Well, the big news is that the land trust has put a, a grant application in for 65 acres of farmland in the town of Burrowville. If we're successful, it'll be the first farmland in the town that will be protected by a land trust or a, or some type of agency for conservation and and also for continuing farming the the one fascinating thing about this particular farm this 65 acres 
is that, and I know I'm going to get the number wrong, but I think it's 35 acres are prime agricultural soils, which is pretty amazing up here in the Great White North. So uh, we, we've applied uh, for a grant. Actually, actually, we've applied for about four grants for this particular property. And uh, we'll know by, I think, April. So keep your fingers crossed as we are and hope for the best. Good luck. That's cool news, Paul. Thanks. Over to Paul Dolan. We're still working on the farm energy program as we're working on getting our contracts uh, squared away. The other thing that we have coming up is we've been working on a grant on geothermal and um, we have a workshop coming up and, and it's a Zoom workshop and it's on, cli on climate change and um, using batteries for the farm, you know, so that we have solar farmers that put um, the solar stuff up and then when it gets dark, uh, they're not working or if there's a storm, et cetera. So we've been pushing some geothermal, but we also been pushing on batteries to supplement that. But we have a workshop Wednesday, February 24th, 6 to 7.30, it'd be a Zoom session. So if you're interested, contact me and I can give you the Zoom link. Uh, and then we'd be working on our COVID program, trying to see if we can get it to go in May for COVID too whether we can do live or not. So we're still iffy on that. That's where we're standing. Thanks, Paul. Sounds active. And let's go over to Amanda. I don't have much to report, but um, just in terms of the wetlands regulations and comments, I, I would really encourage anyone who hasn't read through them to do that and to provide comments. I know that's um, you know, we've talked about it previously, and I know the deadline's tomorrow, but um, if you're only familiar with the changes in the law, you don't know what it means because the change in the law, so this was our jurisdiction and the change in the law put the jurisdiction here and then the regulations kind of put it back a little bit depending on where you are and what the value of the um, habitat is and all of that. And so um, if you haven't looked at it, I would just encourage you to, to, to understand um, what it actually means. Um, and the, the human side of that is that DEM has indicated that they're getting a lot of comments on both sides and getting pressure to um, do more and to do less. And so it's important that anyone who thinks they should be doing more um, add their voice. So I'll leave that at that. Um, I'm giving a talk on, I think it's going to be on February 3rd to the East Providence Urban Forest. And that's not really super newsworthy, but it is to me because it's one of the first times in a long time I've been able to do like exactly what I was hired to do. Um, but I thought it was mostly newsworthy because I had never heard of East Providence Urban Forest until they approached me. And so I thought folks should know that this is a new conservation, relatively new conservation group that exists. Um, and I had had a little bit of nervousness that um, maybe they, you know, there was like a mutiny from the Conservation Commission or something like that, but they have a good relationship with the Conservation Commission. I'm not sure why they're a separate entity, um, but it sounds like they are um, pretty sharp and pretty motivated, which I also would say of a lot of the folks on their Conservation Commission. But anyway, there's a new group. Um, they're, yeah. Amanda, I think they're, um, they were catalyzed by that golf course um, development. I think that's where that's come out of. Yeah. They worried about solar as well. They didn't specifically mention the golf course, but it was it was definitely like a you know losing losing what we have left. Um, yeah, well, they're frame. Yeah, yeah, it's the go yeah, the golf course is being con is being converted into development or solar. So they framed the golf course as urban forest, and now they're setting out to save it. And I've, I've heard my talk them, will be, sorry, go ahead. And Pat. I've heard from them too, because they're also saying, well, East Providence should have a tree ordinance. And I said, 
they've had one for 30 plus years so that they have to do some research because they were a Tree City USA for decades. They were one of the first ones. So there's been a lot of activity in the past. Yep. Yeah, that came up on the call too. Um, it was an interesting call. But anyway, I was there there are planners on this um, is on this group. So yeah. it's interesting. And that. Ed Poria was one of the first conservation commissioners who started trying to get an organization of uh, conservation commissioners like 30 plus years ago. So they've been active over the decades. I I think of East Providence as one of the most active and savvy towns in the, in the state. So I was yeah. a little bit thrown off by, um, you know, this group that seems so frustrated. It makes it makes a little more sense now with some, some more background. But um, part of my talk is definitely going to be about by the time you get to not in my backyard, you're already too late. Like you had to have planning where you're identifying what's important, yeah. right at the outset. And whether you have a valid reason at that stage or not is almost irrelevant. So. Um, so that'll be part of it. <laughs> yeah, they, they were, in, they reached out to me about, um, well, I, if there were any magic bugs that we could say were on the golf course to save it. And then um, they reached back out, a different person contacted us again to say they knew there were coyotes denning on the golf course and we needed to save their habitat too. So anyway. <laughs> But I think I think they said I, I don't f remember who it was, but I think one of them said nobody cares about anything but coyotes. <laughs> well, they think all we have is coyotes. I know That's that awesome. Cindy can't say anything, but your reactions are just on point. <laughs> <laughs> yep, like that. <clears throat> well, I hope your talk goes well, Amanda. Um, I wonder if there might be any mountain lion sightings over in East Providence too. If um, if uh, you know they're still still being noticed around Rhode Island. We gotta get the Matunic mountain lion up to EP. Yeah, the koi dogs. Yeah. Right. Over That's to, my cue to leave. <laughs> yeah, right. Over to uh, Alana. Uh, do you have any updates? Um. Yeah, so for those that are, that are interested in an uh, FEMC update, it's, I guess, a little similar to what I said last month. Um, I know uh, the Woodland Partnership has enough on its plate, so we're working to populate a standalone FEMC committee um, with representation from our natural resource agencies, departments, divisions, university representation, and nonprofits and such, um, including the Woodland Partnership. Um, so we're working towards that right now. Um, in terms of, you know, other actions, you know, with FBMC and higher up, I know that they're still in the coordinating phase of, you know, the regional efforts that were, you know, decided upon in the um, 2021 work plan. Um, so perhaps within the coming months and into the spring, we'll see a little bit more action um, and I'll hear a little bit more about that. So just a question about the state committee structure. Uh, I guess when when the Rhode Island first joined the FEMC, the Woodland Partnership had sort of served essentially as the state committee, and, and now you're kind of establishing a, a a committee in which the Woodland Partnership would be one member. Is that um, how I understand it? Yeah, um, at least one, a couple. Um, yeah, we'd like to have definitely representation from the Woodland Partnership and solid forestry representation, but we'd also like to have some room for some of our other, you know, water resources, wildlife, and um, from the university and a bit of the, uh, you know, invasive species pest um, specialist presence as well. Yeah, sure. So, so we won't have the, uh, the, the one Woodland Partnership meeting a year wouldn't then be devoted to the, the state committee then. That would be a, a separate Meeting. That would be a separate, yeah, and of course, but, uh, you know, the communication lines are open, and I know that this is definitely, like, you know, I think it'll just be a, a, a good connection and a back and forth. Sounds good. And uh, Cynthia, have any any um, updates or emojis uh, if you'd like to contribute in the, the chat box? Um, oh, there we go. Well, um, definitely, we've definitely enjoyed I'm glad to have you on the call today.
Um, Christopher, just uh, one one other thing. I don't know if everybody's got the got the email from Rupert Friday, but he's retiring. Um, looks like everybody's mostly mostly everybody's nodding their head. And um, after 17 years, I think uh, I think I've known Rupert for at least 17. So the idea on the timing of that, Paul? July. He's, or July. Uh, he's gone by July 1st. And uh, they're, they're putting together a committee to uh, open up the position and hire someone new. Mm -hmm. Thanks for contributing that, Paul. That's a, that's a pretty significant update, um, uh, given all that Rupert's done, the uh, length of his tenure with the Land Trust Council. Kate, uh, how about you? You've always got plenty of updates. Sure. Um, so, I just spoke to Chris Modisette this morning and the easements RCPP grant that I worked on with David and DM and um, Rupert and Joanne Richtelli is going to national for review. So I guess things are moving at the state level. They thought it was a good idea. We were the only application. <laughs> there was one question that they had about our map um and that's good good news so i guess we find out hopefully by march whether or not we um move ahead with that rcpp grant uh with southern new england heritage forest we have eight new applicants that have been approved for plans i'm going to be letting them know this week um so for some background those are the um forest management plans with bird habitat um plans incorporated from Audubon. Uh, as Christopher mentioned, we had a meeting with Sean O'Rourke and a few other folks from the Infrastructure Bank last Friday uh, to kind of brainstorm aggregating projects with their water quality um, funds, their, sur their surcharge, Christopher, is that it? Their water quality protection surcharge funds. <laughs> uh, a I apologize, a truck just went by. So we, they have about, I think a million dollars a year that is supposed to be split evenly amongst uh, water supply managers. Um, and oftentimes that's not the case. So it's uh, brainstorming ways that we can collectively look at that funding and look at projects um, in watersheds uh, conservation preservation projects in watersheds for land protection using those funds um, and they are going to be in attendance at our next meeting. Uh, Alana approached me on about the FEMC committee so I said yes to that uh, either as part of the district or Woodland Partnership whatever <laughs> you need me as I'll be there for that and forestry for Rhode Island both. Okay sounds works uh, Forestry for Rhode Island's birds. I ha I and have been meaning to send an email to Jeff Ruderson and Elaine Fielding from Connecticut Audubon, who have led trainings um, on forestry for the birds in Connecticut to adapt um, and think about how to roll these workshops out coming this spring and summer. We did get that one-year extension, um, and we have a little bit of time left on that. So just making sure we get those workshops done in the new state of being that is COVID um, between. And then also I'm hoping that in late spring, early summer, we are able to do a natural resources professionals training via Zoom. Um, it would be the easiest way to pull all the foresters and wildlife folks uh, together from around the state. Um, and I think that that's it. Happy New Year. Thanks, Kate. Not there. Was that, was that last part about pulling the forestry and wildlife professionals together, is that related to or separate from the Oak Resiliency Grant? Separate. It's forestry for the birds. Right. But it, okay. It so it's like a training on how, it's a training for foresters on incorporating bird habitat into forest management plans. So using the resources that we created through forestry for the birds 
in everyday planning and same with bringing in Audubon and wildlife folks. Okay. Sorry, you threw me off when you said wildlife folks. There's just a lot, it's just a lot going on. So Thanks. it's all good. <laughs> so, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the, the Oak Resiliency Grant, Amanda, but we'll, um, in the follow-up email, we'll, we'll try to distribute a link to the landowner town hall um, from noon to 1 p.m. on February 2nd um, for the landowners, you know, um, certainly, you know, professionals are, are welcome to participate. There'll also be a follow-up kind of Q&A discussion the following Saturday morning, uh, that's February 6th from, you know, 9 to around 10 a.m. Um, virtually, of course. And, you know, we are going to be hosting the Oak Resiliency Assessment Workshop, uh, where we do I want to include, you know, wildlife biologists, you know, as, as well as foresters. Um, I think it's important to get the, the wildlife voice in as much as possible. Um, however, it's going to be, well, while still online, it's going to be postponed to, to the spring um, just to allow some more, some more time um, to develop the web-based assessment tool and, you know, to try to put a good program together. So we'll be in communication about that as well. Um, but, you know, certainly for some of you, I think it would be of interest to you, um, you know, Mark and, and Fern um, and, and perhaps some others as well. Um, you know, to switch it over to, you know, put on my, my URI hat. Um, some of you might be aware of the um, Climate Adaptation Silviculture Research Project uh, that UConn and Connecticut Deep are setting up uh, in Eastern Connecticut. Um, I participated in the, you know, the, the planning workshop through the Oak Resiliency Grant and uh, been, you know, working on um, trying to see if we can get Rhode Island involved as well, since they, they need more, more land for replications of the resistance, uh, resilience and transition treatments, basically, and, um, you know, looking at a possible URI, you know, DEM partnership, you know, where these, you know, research treatments could be, you know, implemented on, um, you know, on, a, you know, a state management area, and then, you know, carry that research, you know, forth, uh, or if it didn't work out with DEM, you know, maybe possibly with NRCS funding. Uh, but I, you know, I think that's, that's pretty exciting. And in some ways, it's, has some similarities to the, the project that I developed at Providence Water, but this is real research. Um, but it, it is the, the first project in, in Southern New England and could be uh, cool for Rhode Island to be involved along with Connecticut. So um, keep you posted on what happens with that. Some preliminary good signs, uh, but we'll see. Anybody have any questions um, for each other or other updates. Forgot Fern. I, I thought I went already. You did. She went up to did you. Here. Oh, I forgot you. Sorry. <laughs> kind of chiming in on the wet wetlands there. Cindy, where's your emoji? Pete. I have a question. Hey. Pete, is tomorrow your birthday? Maybe. Hey, happy birthday, Kate. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Have a super. It's your birthday, water. Kate. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Tomorrow. Oh, okay. oh happy, birthday. happy birthday. Thanks. Do you? <laughs> Someone next, got next face. year's the big one. So. Oh. <laughs> the big one. I mean, what are you, you going to be thirty? Oh right. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> well, hope you get to enjoy it. Um, I guess this brings us to the end of you know our our partnership meeting. So Kate and I will um, will follow up with uh, Sean O'Rourke uh, and his team and communicate, uh, and then you know 
uh, be in touch with the, with the date and information uh, for the February meeting, which I think will be a, a pretty interesting one. And um, or we, we had a, a preliminary you know, discussion and meeting uh, with, with Sean um, and uh, Sydney from, from his team and uh, someone who's, who's working on the American Forest Grant as well. So I hope that um, you guys will be able to join that meeting. Uh, but we've got the the, uh, the hardcore members here, so I anticipate that you will. Uh, well, well, thanks very much, everyone, for joining this afternoon. Good to see your faces. Stay warm. Hi, and everybody. We'll, uh, Bye. See you in the woods Bye, or on Zoom. Hi, thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.